I want to thank everybody who is watching this webinar. This is the authors and insight segments that the McCain Institute does on an occasional basis. I want to thank the McCain Institute for making this possible. Uh, my name is John Decker. I am the White House correspondent and senior national editor at Gray Television. And the author that we have joining us today is Ambassador Ted Osius. And let me just tell you a little bit about uh, the former ambassador. He uh, served 30 years as a US diplomat, including serving as the US ambassador to Vietnam during the Obama administration from 2014 to 2017. Uh, after serving our country, he, he worked for a time at Google and currently he serves as the president and CEO of the US ASEAN Business Council. If you're not familiar with that, in, it was founded in 1984 and it represents 170 of the largest American businesses in Southeast Asia through its headquarters here in Washington, DC. And hopefully Ambassador, I did a good job of uh, just bringing people up to speed in terms of your background. And let's, let's talk a little bit about your book. And I think the best way to talk about your book, Nothing is Impossible, Americans Reconciliation with Vietnam is actually starting with John McCain. It was 54 years ago today that John McCain was shot down over Hanoi. And it's pretty remarkable. We're talking about your book uh, on this occasion. Of course, he uh, was captured, uh, held in Vietnam for five and a half years, released ultimately in 1973. But I think that's the place where you wanted to start our discussion as well, Ambassador. I do. Thank you, John, for the, your kind introduction. And thanks very much uh, for, for welcoming me uh, for, in this discussion. I'm a big admirer of John McCain. It's, it's no secret. And I do. I start my book with him. Um, I had the privilege of, of getting to know him over the years, always through the, the lens of Vietnam, uh, because I, I, I spent a lot of time in Vietnam and he spent a lot of time. He spent more time than I did. Uh, in Vietnam. Um, but let's start 54 years ago today, October 26, 1967. Um, uh, John McCain was 31 years old. He was shot down over Chuk Bak Lake in Hanoi. And uh, just the process of ejecting, uh, ejecting from his plane broke both of his arms and his leg. So by the time he hit the water very hard, um, he was he was hurting, um, and the because he, he had been in the process of bombing the city, bombing infrastructure, um, uh, wreaking a lot of destruction on Hanoi. The people who swim swam out to him didn't really have saving John McCain on the top of their minds. They were they were pissed off, and they dragged him ashore. Somebody stuck a bayonet in his groin. Um, he was hauled off to. Hualo prison, where, as you mentioned, John, he spent the next five and a half years. Uh, the, the nickname for Hualo prison is the fiery furnace. Uh, it's where the French kept their prisoners, Vietnamese independence um, uh, agitators. And then, of course, it's where the Vietnamese kept American prisoners of war uh, for the latter part of the, of the war between the United States and Vietnam. In any case, uh, he was in very bad shape by the time he got to the prison, and then things kind of got worse. Um, they, his limbs were set with no anesthetic. Uh, his um, wounds were just left to, for, for him to either recover from his wounds or not. Uh, there wasn't a great interest in his well-being, except by, on the part of his fellow prisoners. There was a prisoner named um, Bob Craner who. Uh, McCain writes about, uh, who really nursed him, uh, you know, pulled him back from, from, from death. And uh, by the time McCain was brought before the warden in June of uh, 1968, he was less than 100 pounds. He was barely able to stand. Uh, he was in very bad shape. And, but the warden had figured out that he was the son of Admiral McCain and the grandson of another Admiral McCain and realized that he had a really valuable prisoner in his prison. So he said to, uh, to, uh, to McCain, 
you can go. We will, we will send you back to the United States. Now, someone who'd been through what he'd been through, that must have been very appealing. But uh, he was, he knew the military code. The military code says you will, it's first in, first out. Only the first prisoner to go in should be the first one to go out. You don't jump the queue. So the warden said, well, you think about it. He went back and he talked to his friend, uh, Bob. And Bob said, you know, there's an exemption to the code. If you are about to die, you're allowed to accept uh, going uh, freedom. You're allowed to, to do what you need to do to survive. But <laughs> that was not what he chose to do. He stuck to the code. And the reason I want to tell this story in some detail, it's been written about before, of course, but the way I really got to know John McCain. Um, I knew him a little bit when I'd been a young officer. I went and called on him when I was uh, about to be, I hoped, confirmed to be the sixth US ambassador to Vietnam. And I knew when I went in, you know, if John McCain supported me, then I would I'd become ambassador. And if he opposed my nomination, I wouldn't become ambassador. Sure. Uh, and he took me by the arm and walked me over to a wall in his office and showed me a framed telegram from the Paris peace talks where there was a sentence highlighted that said the, war the warden at Hualo prison, the Hanoi Hilton uh, offered Admiral McCain's son the chance to leave and he didn't. And at the time I wondered why he was showing me this line from that telegram and only later reflecting upon it, I think, well, he was telling me who he was and he was telling me about this key moment in his life where he made a, a patriotic decision that was most likely gonna re result in his death. Fortunately for all of us, it didn't. Uh, but he, that I think was a, a pivotal uh, choice that he made in his life that really shaped it going forward. Now I'll wrap up this, uh, this story with by flashing forward to uh, 1991, to February, 1991. Um, John McCain, young senator, newly elected senator, uh, was sitting on a, uh, a plane heading to uh, observe the results of Operation Desert Storm in Kuwait. And sitting across the aisle from him was John Kerry. Now, McCain's a Republican, was a Republican, uh, John Kerry, a Democrat. They had very, very different experiences during the war, but they were sitting almost knee to knee on this congressional delegation flight. And as John Kerry tells the story, they started a conversation that lasted all night and then lasted uh, another three decades because they, they became friends that night. And they, uh, they decided to, even though they saw the war so differently, they had such different experiences during the war, they, they, and they had such different political experiences. McCain had even campaigned against Kerry, when Kerry was running for the Senate in Massachusetts, uh, they decided to make common cause on the issue of Vietnam. They decided it was good for America if we could turn an enemy into a friend. And they set out to prove a negative really hard. They had to prove that there were no longer any, any live Americans being held in tiger cages or otherwise held in Southeast Asia. And that he, they had to prove that the Vietnamese would be uh, would be helpful in the fullest possible accounting for those whom we'd lost during the war. This was a key, key issue for the United States was that fullest possible accounting. And they set up a select uh, committee on POW MIA affairs. They worked like dogs to, to, to prove this negative. They were successful. They went to Vietnam many times and they were the ones who made it possible for this reconciliation that I describe in, in my book for uh, two, two countries that have been adversaries to become friends and partners. It was because of their courage and they both took enormous amount of heat for it, but they did it, they went ahead. Well, Sorry, both not story, too long. No, no, not at all. Both of those stories, uh, Mr. Ambassador, tell you so much about the character of Senator McCain. I, yes. I, I was fortunate enough to interview <laughs> Senator McCain about uh, his time in prison. And, and I came away with, I think, some of the same 
things that you just described about the character of John McCain. So this is 1991 when he has this conversation with uh, Senator John Kerry. And let's fast forward uh, about four or five years later, and it's Senator McCain who is the lead advocate in the idea of normalizing relations with a country that America fought a very bitter war with uh, that led to the deaths of, of, of just countless American, uh, American soldiers, American service, uh, servicemen and women. And explain how it is that Senator McCain could get past all of the bad feelings, which uh, quite frankly would be understandable to the point where he's talking about normalizing relations with this country. So, I, I mean, I think the explanation is actually fairly simple. He was a patriot above all. His own feelings, I'm sure, were very strong uh, given what he'd been through. But he and a man named Pete Peterson, the first US ambassador to Vietnam, who'd also been a prisoner in Hualo prison, who'd also eaten nothing but pumpkin for six months out of the year, who had also been tortured. Uh, Pete came out from the prison and said, I left my hate at the gate. I don't know that, that uh, Senator McCain left all of his hate at the gate, I don't know. But I do know that he made a, a decision that was deeply patriotic. And it wasn't about his feelings, it was about what was right for America. And so you mentioned that was four years after 1991, it was the spring of 1995. He decided that uh, because we, they made enormous progress in fullest possible accounting and they had, they had cooperation uh, from the Vietnamese and they thought they could do much more to account for those whom we'd lost by moving forward with normalization, that it was in America's interest to do so. He also was thinking about uh, geopolitics. He right. was thinking it would be helpful if we were with this, this uh, long, country on China's southern border, it would be very helpful if we could develop a relationship over time with that country. It would, it would advance America's interests. He wasn't so much thinking about our commercial interests. He was thinking, I think, about our strategic interests and what America needed to move beyond the pain of the war. And so he provided political cover for Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton had, you know, during the campaign had been called a draft dodger, uh, he hadn't served. John McCain, everybody knew John McCain was deeply patriotic and had plenty of reasons to be mad at the communists in Vietnam. So I don't think Bill Clinton could have moved forward with normalization without support from John McCain. Now, John McCain, again, this tells something about who he was. When I would say something like that in public in Vietnam, he would say, oh no, Bill Clinton deserves the credit. For having, for that, for normalization. Well, that's that's what I think uh, John McCain would say. I, I, just, I don't really agree. I think it was John McCain who took enormous risks. That his party was then in charge in Congress, and it would have been very easy to just put a halt to that process of normalization. Bob Dole, the, who was later later ran against uh, Bill Clinton, uh, was firmly against normalization. Jesse Helms was against it. Lots of veterans opposed normalization, but John McCain thought it was in America's best interest. And so it, that is pretty remarkable. And I, I agree with you. I think it's pretty clear that had uh, Senator McCain not been such a strong advocate for normalizing relations, it's it's pretty clear to, to, to you, to, to me, to so many others that that would certainly not have happened way back in 1995. Yeah. So President uh, Bill Clinton normalizes relations. He names as the first US ambassador to Vietnam, a person that you just mentioned, Pete Peterson. Uh, yes. Pete, in, in taking on this role, what, were, what were his goals? What did he want to accomplish as the first US ambassador to Vietnam? Well, I had the privilege of working for him. I was a, a young political officer in Hanoi, and he, I remember him arriving in May of 1997, broiling hot, um, and welcoming him on the tarmac. He stated right, at, right up front when he got out in front of the cameras that moment, here's what I'm gonna do. We're gonna pursue fullest possible accounting. 
And then we're gonna start developing an economic relationship. And my ultimate goal is a bilateral trade agreement with Vietnam. And that's what he did. He, we, we pursued fullest possible accounting as the number one mission goal. But he also uh, worked to make sure that there was a, uh, uh, there were some other issues that we were able to address together. We were able to educate Vietnamese in the United States. We were able to uh, work on science and technology, on standards, on health, on non-political issues. And we were able ultimately to negotiate and conclude a bilateral trade agreement that brought Vietnam into the fold economically and was the precursor of Vietnam's entry into the World Trade Organization. So it was the, it really marked, uh, the Vietnamese had made their own decisions about about opening to the world economically, but the United States was able to, to really kind of usher Vietnam into the global economy. Uh, and again, not so much because of our commercial interests, but because we thought it was in our geostrategic right. interest to have a, a stable, a solid, decent relationship with Vietnam. In the mid 1990s, uh, was it thought that Vietnam uh, could be uh, an economic powerhouse the way it is today in this part of the world? Or, or was that something that was a long ways off in terms of what was uh, expected of this country? That was a really long way off. Yeah. In the mid 90s, Vietnam was one of the two poorest countries in Asia. More than half of the population lived below the poverty line, less than $2 a day people were living on. And today, and this has something to do with what Pete Peterson and others did, today, about 6% of Vietnamese live below the poverty line. So there was this trajectory up uh, in, in Vietnam's economy that I think accelerated with the bilateral trade agreement. And then around 2008 really shot up because it became uh, a favored destination for European businesses, American businesses, Asian businesses, and so Vietnam really took off from about 2008. But let me just tell one more story about Pete Peterson, just to give you a sense of who this guy was. And you'll hear echoes of, of John McCain, I think. This, the day after he arrived on that tarmac, uh, he was welcomed to the, the presidential palace. Now, the, what happens when you present credentials is at least in, in his time, changed a little bit by the time I did it, um, but in his time, he was put into a, a white limousine with white flags flying on all four corners, with white motorcycles flying, uh, traveling on all, all four sides of the limousine, uh, front and behind. Um, they were flying white flags. It was all, you know, very dramatic. And he gets whoosh, he, uh, driven up to the the uh, presidential palace, walks up this long flight of of red stairs, we used to call it Oz, um, it, you know, because it's very, very grand. It's the great and powerful Oz was standing at the top. And he goes and he presents his credentials. And then he returned to the embassy and he, he said to me, Ted, you know, that was perhaps the strangest experience of my life. The last time I was in a Vietnamese vehicle, I was shackled to the floor. Wow. So he had gone and really, really relatively short time from being prisoner of war to being ambassador of the United States and to creating a new, making peace with an old enemy. And he relished it. Uh, and he set the tone for really for the next uh, 30 years of, of the relationship. Oh, that's pretty clear. And, and part of, of the job, if not the, the major part of a job of being an ambassador is building trust. Uh, yes. In terms of building trust, I can't think of a more difficult job when you're talking about building trust uh, with two former enemies, uh, two countries that formerly fought each other um, in a, a war that caused uh, casualties, countless casualties on both sides. Uh, how did he go about building that trust uh, over the years? Uh, how, how was it that he was able to uh, ultimately gain the trust of all aspects of Vietnamese society? So I think two things. Internally, he empowered people. So his, that first day, he sat us around a black table and he said, you all, I'm going to tell you something that my 
commanding officer told me uh, when I was in the Air Force, you're going to get it right 98% of the time. The other 2%, I'll eat it. In other words, go out and take risks for peace. And he let us. He had us take risks. And he knew we knew he had our backs. And so we took risks. We built relationships. We built trust. And then with the Vietnamese, he... He, he, I don't think he's capable of telling an untruth. This is a guy who's so straightforward and he had such credibility with the Vietnamese. They knew he'd suffered. At one point, he and the defense minister showed their scars. They'd both been tortured in the same prison. Him by the Vietnamese, the defense minister by the, by the French. They spoke, in many ways, they spoke the same language. And he actually ended up marrying a Vietnamese-born uh, woman, uh, uh, the, she was the commercial attache at the Australian embassy. And that moment, that wedding in the cathedral in Hanoi was a moment of reconciliation. But he had, he built trust by being really straightforward with people, always telling, always telling the truth, and then figuring out ways that we could do things together. Because I think trust is about relationships and it's about doing things together that strengthen those relationships, strengthen trust, and enable partnership ultimately to develop. In, in reading your book, Mr. Ambassador, it's pretty clear that you develop this, this connection, this love of Vietnam as a junior foreign service officer. And then let's fast forward many years later to the point where you are being considered to be the US ambassador to Vietnam. Explain how this process works, if you could. Uh, whether you were the sole candidate for this position and ultimately how, uh, at the time, President Obama settled on you as the envoy to Vietnam. Well, thanks. I, there's in the corner of the, of the cover of the book, see a little bicycle. Uh, I love biking and I biked everywhere in Vietnam. I, when I was there as a, as a young officer, I biked from Hanoi to Saigon with a group of nine friends. Um, I just loved seeing the country. I, I had learned the language. I loved speaking the language. I love the fact that, you know, people would look at me and they look, I look like this and I would speak Vietnamese and they'd be so surprised and they'd be so welcoming. And so I, you know, I, I fell in love with the country. And then when it, when, uh, you know, a number of years later, the post was coming open, I thought, well, this is just, this is going to be impossible. Um, you know, it would be too hard. I, I wasn't all that senior. Uh, there, there were 12 people who were going for the job. They were all, every single one of them was senior to me. Um, but I had this one advantage. I spoke Vietnamese. And, and, and uh, John Kerry knew that. He had, I had been his control officer in Vietnam. He knew I spoke Vietnamese. Pete Peterson, the first U.S. ambassador, uh, of course, knew that. And actually, he made a call to John McCain, and I think to John Kerry as well, saying, you know, this, this guy's okay. He really does care about Vietnam. He would do a good job for you. So I think it's because, you know, because I spoke Vietnamese and, and people who believed in the relationship uh, believed that I could do a good job. And um, I did my best. I loved it. It was like you know, the privilege of a, of a lifetime to be able to do this job. And I wasn't going to let people down. I really didn't want to let people down. I wanted to move the relationship forward, and I was uh, privileged to be able to do so. I want to get into that, certainly, uh, Mr. Ambassador, but uh, let's take a step back just for a moment uh, and talk a little bit. You touched upon it, but talk a little bit about the role that Senator McCain played in ultimately you know, giving his his blessing on this nomination. Uh, you, you, you indicated you had to meet with uh, Senator McCain, pretty powerful Republican uh, as it relates to foreign affairs. Uh, what was that conversation like and, and how did you ultimately win his trust and his backing for this post? Well, he was on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And so if, you know, that's the first place you, you go to have a confirmation hearing. And so if he had said, if he had said no, I wouldn't have had a chance. If he didn't want me in that job, there's no way. And I think he had a right to, to that view. He knew how important an ambassador's job is. And so 
So I went to see him the day before the hearings and he was you know, kind enough to receive me. And I said, you know, Senator, I, I would really, really deeply, I'd be deeply grateful if I could have your support. And he said, you have it. Pete, Peter, Pete Peterson and I talked, I'm gonna support you. And I, and I told you the story about him uh, you know, revealing a little bit of, sure. of himself. He also made a request of me. He said, there's a monument by Truk Buck Lake where I was shot down. Can you get it cleaned up? And can you make sure they note that I'm Navy, not Air Force? And have them spell my name right, by the way. And I said, you know, Senator, if, if cleaning it up means I have to go there with a toothbrush myself, I will do it. In fact, we did, it did get cleaned up. His name is spelled right. Uh, he's listed in the right service. Everything um, was, was uh, quickly done properly. But then in the hearings, because he knows how, how solemn the obligations are, he knows that bad decisions by ambassador lead to people dying. Um, he gave me a rough time. He asked me the hardest questions. He kind of pounded me. And I guess I gave good answers because his, his support never wavered. And um, I thought, you know, this is, the, this is as it should be. He has an obligation to know that I'm, uh, an obligation to make sure that every nominee is up to the job. And he wanted to be absolutely certain that I was. Uh, and then he visited when I was there. I had the honor of hosting him, traveling with him in, uh, in, in Vietnam. And I'll just tell you one thing about that. He came with a delegation of three other senators and everybody wanted to see him. You know, the president, the prime minister, the head of the communist party, every, everyone wanted to see him. He's so revered in Vietnam. And in every meeting, he would say like a word or two and then he would pass it to his colleagues to do the talking. And I kept thinking, well, wait a minute, he knows everything about Vietnam. Why is he letting these Dilettante, sorry, but you know, they didn't know very much compared to him. Uh, why are you having them do all the talking? And then it suddenly occurred to me, he, when he, he knew that at some point he would be gone and he wanted others to own the relationship. So again, it wasn't about him or his ego. It was about what's in America's interest. It was in America's interest that there be other senators who felt strongly about the relationship and who were engaged in it. And the Vietnamese, understood this. They knew why he was doing what he, what he was doing. Um, so, it, you know, to me, every lesson was uh, a lesson in, you know, what it, what it is to be a, a real patriot, to truly, truly be a public, public servant, which he was. When Senator McCain took that CODEL that you just described, and when you're the ambassador at this time, Vietnam looks a lot different than it did when uh, Ambassador P. Peterson uh, yes. took on the role of the American envoy in Vietnam. So as a result, describe the differences between then and the time that you are now the American ambassador in Vietnam. It's not just uh, a country of strategic importance. It's also a country that has developed, as you described earlier, into one of great economic importance. It was, it was, it was transformed. So when I had been there the first time in the mid nineties, every, I was a bicyclist, everybody rode bicycles. So I was always moving at the, at the pace of traffic um, because there weren't cars, there were you know, some trucks and, uh, but there were very, very few cars. And by the time I uh, went back as ambassador, the streets were full of cars, uh, for, for better or worse, the streets were, were crowded with cars and the, uh, you know, there had been, it had been a very poor country. I mentioned how many people were lived below the poverty line. There were Hermes and Louis Vuitton stores. And even, I think in some ways more significant than that, there was the internet. So people hadn't, weren't able to communicate freely in Vietnam before. It's a one party state. Uh, this, that one party controls the media. Um, and, but the internet changed things. So there was, people were saying pretty much whatever they wanted on the internet. There were some limits and bloggers would, would sometimes be put in jail for expressing their beliefs, which I uh, protested vehemently when I was ambassador. But in general, they had made the decision, look, let the internet go, we need it. Um, and they didn't erect a big uh, 
firewall the way the Chinese did. They, they developed their own systems. The prime minister at the time, Nguyen Tan Zong, said, you know, cadres, when you see errors on the, on the internet, well, correct those errors, put out the truth. Right. And so there was actually quite a, a vibrant debate on the internet about pretty much everything. And then one other big thing happened just before, or a few months before I became ambassador. China parked an oil rig on Vietnam's exclusive economic zone, in, within Vietnam's exclusive economic zone, and it's on the continental shelf, just off the coast, uh, the central coast um, near Da Nang. And this was such a, a, an obvious brash bullying tactic that it really made the Vietnamese angry. The, there, there's no Vietnamese person who doesn't have it in his or her DNA to resist domination by a foreign power. And the foreign power that has mostly has dominated Vietnam most of all is China, because it, for 900 years, Vietnam was part of China. I think 22 wars have been fought against China. All of the national heroes, with a couple of exceptions, Ho Chi Minh and General Zap, all the rest of them are all people who fought the Chinese. And so there was a greater willingness on Vietnam's part to engage with us strategically. And guess who wanted to take advantage of that? Senator McCain, he saw that as an opportunity and that's what he focused on. He focused on maritime security when he visited and what we could do to bring, to, uh, uh, to pressure countries to adhere to the rule of law in South China Sea. And that's, uh, that was his focus. He had, brought, he had resources um, and he had a strategy and he made it very clear to the Vietnamese we were on the same side on that issue. The Vietnamese, though, from for their part, and we were talking about this uh, leading up to our conversation that we're having right now, uh, really understood the unique role that they had. There were these uh, spheres of influence. You had America and you had China. Explain how they navigate that, how they figure it out so that they're doing things that don't unnecessarily um, engage in a negative way the other side? So I think any effective Vietnamese, Vietnamese leader, any experienced Vietnamese leader will know how to do that balancing act, will have learned how to do it. Because if you've got China, you know, 1.2, 1.3 billion people on your northern border, 1,200 mile long border, and China very dominant in the South China Sea, I think the second biggest navy in the world, um, then you got to be able to deal with that. And so every, every Vietnamese leader that I know of has engaged in a balancing act. And just one example, um, before the General Secretary of the Communist Party came to the United States uh, to meet Barack Obama in the Oval Office, he was invited to Beijing by Xi Jinping. And of course he went, uh, he went and he, uh, spent some time there. They rolled out the red carpet, a visit that was quite high on protocol, maybe not so high on substance. Uh, and he did that before going to the United States um, because he knew that was the way to balance things. And when, when um, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris went to Vietnam, just before she arrived, the Chinese ambassador called on the prime minister. And it's, again, it's a, you know, it's a balancing act that they just have to play out because this is, this is their neighborhood. This is the reality. The last war they fought against China is not that long ago. It's from 79 to 91, they fought uh, you know, a 12 year border war against Chinese. Thousands and thousands of people died every year in that war. And then since then there have been skirmishes in the South China Sea, but um, these memories are very fresh for the Vietnamese. You um, have alluded to your, your bike riding uh, that you did. Yes throughout your, your years uh, as U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam, what other ways did you uh, maintain and build trust with the Vietnamese people and Vietnamese institutions? Well, the bike riding helped because it, if, you, if you travel on a bike, it's not like traveling in a limousine with, with right. tinted windows or flying over in a plane, you're accessible. And, and people knew I spoke Vietnamese and I would talk to people by the side of the road. And um, 
you know, have drinks and a be ahoy. And, and, and uh, I, I was accessible and that helped. But I think probably even more important than that, uh, I showed respect. Um, I, Vietnamese is a hard language and I had worked really hard to, to learn Vietnamese and I used it all the time. I used it in speeches and interviews and, and when traveling and in meetings. And uh, that showed respect. And then I respected Vietnam's cultural traditions in particular, Tet, the Vietnamese version of Mother's Day. Um, I, would, I would show respect to ancient traditions uh, because I wanted to, actually as much as anything else, I wanted to. I do respect the, the people of Vietnam. Uh, I respect their independent history and culture. And when I could show that, I loved to. So, um, so as often as possible, I found ways to respect Vietnam's history, its culture, its language, and its people. You know, for an American president, taking a foreign trip uh, is something in which a lot of planning goes into that effort. In fact, uh, in just a few days, President Biden is going to be taking the second foreign trip of his presidency to Rome and also to Glasgow. Uh, President Obama, who named you as U.S. ambassador, took a foreign trip, and he took a foreign trip to Vietnam. What went into all of that? How did that all come about, that of all the places that President Obama uh, could possibly travel to in Asia, for instance, he's choosing Vietnam? Well, he traveled to almost every Southeast Asian country, but he clearly... I knew from the get-go that he wanted to come to Vietnam. I knew from uh, well before I became ambassador. In my view, it takes about two years to properly prepare for a presidential visit if you want it to have a lot of substance. So we spent an enormous amount of time preparing the substantive parts of that visit. The, the parts with the, you know, the nice scenery and the photo, the, the photo opportunities and the speeches, that can all be done in a few weeks. That's not hard. It's the, the substantive aspects of a really important visit. One of the things I did was I facilitated uh, a trip by the General Secretary of the Communist Party to Washington, D.C., to the Oval Office. That opened up a huge arena of potential collaboration. That allowed us to bring uh, Vietnam into the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade agreement, which later became the CPTPP, and it allowed us to deepen our security relationship. But we ended up on, uh, during President Obama's visit, we ended up moving forward 21 major initiatives. This involved signings, uh, this involved uh, presidential uh, appearance in certain venues. We really, really took advantage of that visit to move the relationship forward substantively. Because I believe if you're doing things together, that's how you build trust. So if you're working together on health or the environment or on trade or on security, you're building trust just by those activities. And um, we, um, there was a decision to bring in the Peace Corps. It took a, a while to implement it, um, there, but there were multiple, multiple decisions were made during that visit. And the president, the president loved Vietnam. You could just tell. There were a million people who turned out to greet him wow. in Ho Chi Minh City. And he, he did things that presidents that aren't expected you? to do. What's did that? that? Did that surprise you? The, the, the uh, number of people, the incredibly large number of people that turned out to see an American president? Oh, in, oh in, yeah. yeah. It, I, I was blown away. I, I mean, I've been with Bill Clinton on his visit in 2000. And I've been astonished by how many people had welcomed Bill Clinton. And I think the, you know, this, when, when we motorcade past, there were probably 60 in, in uh, people waiting by the side of the road. Well, by that, when Obama came in, in uh, 2016, it was probably 30 people deep. There were literally a million people out on the streets to see his motorcade at, to welcome him. He said in his seven years at that point, seven years as president, there was only one other trip where he'd had a, a welcome anywhere near as warm. And so he, he really liked it. And, you know, and he did all these things that you don't really expect a U.S. president to do. He interviewed young entrepreneurs. He had a town hall meeting with young people. This, this actually kind of was very, was very hard for the Vietnamese leadership to, to, to 
embrace because they want set piece meetings, each of the leaders, and they don't really want anything else. Um, but we negotiated and said, yes, the, you'll have the meetings with all of the leaders, but what our president wants is to really learn something about the country. And then P P they were quite surprised that he had boon cha with Anthony Bourdain. This is a simple meal of noodles and beer, $6 for both of them, two beers each, um, at, a, at a very simple shop in Hanoi. And he, he did that rather than a big state dinner. Now he did a state lunch to show respect to his hosts, but he had boon cha for dinner with Anthony Bourdain. And the Vietnamese people loved it. They loved that he enjoyed their cuisine and he was doing something simple that, that other Vietnamese, that Vietnamese citizens would do. It was one of the highlights of the, of the trip. And another highlight was you couldn't script this stuff. You can only make the conditions where it's possible. Um, he was taking questions from this young audience right. and a woman stands up and she says, so I'm a rapper and I rap about corruption and about rich people. And, and he said, give me what you got. I'll give you a beat, but um, but um. And she started to rap and I, <laughs> she was amazing. And the interaction was amazing. And it kind of went viral at the time because I think people expected to see, you know, baggy suited communists. And they saw this hip young woman rapper. And it was not the image that people expected to see of Vietnam. And, and I, and it, but it was a beautiful image. And, and it showed that, you know, Vietnam had arrived. So uh, it, there's no doubt that after the visit takes place, you're doing high fives with everybody in the embassy, you know, yes. with, with such a successful visit by uh, the American president. What is the reaction post-visit by the Vietnamese people and the Vietnamese government? Did they see it as, as much of a success as you saw it? It was really positive. I was sitting next to some very senior Vietnamese officials when the president gave his big speech in Hanoi. And he, on human rights, he was very direct, uh, very clear, very direct. And I thought, oh boy, what kind of reaction is this gonna elicit? But I turned to my neighbors and they, they said, wonderful. You know, they loved the speech. They loved the respect that he showed, even though he highlighted our differences, he showed respect to Vietnam's uh, history and culture. And so they could take the criticism because it was coupled with respect. It wasn't, we're coming to tell you how to do things, you foreigners. It was, it was offered with a, a bit of humility. He had done the same thing with the uh, Communist Party chief when he said, when talking about human rights, he said, this is just who we are. It's not because we're perfect. We make our own mistakes, but it is, it is who America is to try to promote human rights. And that was probably the one toughest part of the visit. Uh, the president wanted to meet with civil society representatives, uh, some of whom were, were uh, activists. And that was very hard for the Vietnamese to swallow. In the end, it happened. It wasn't perfect, but it happened. And um, afterwards, I had been upset that it wasn't perfect. And the president said to me, relax, Ted, you know, it takes time. This is, this is a new thing. It's not all, they're not used to having a head of state come and want to meet with their, the opposition in a sense. And he said, it, it takes time, so it's, it's okay. And, you know, <laughs> and he was right, it was okay. And the uh, government reacted very strongly and the people of Vietnam uh, still talk about the visit, that visit and how important that was in highlighting our friendship and bringing us together. This visit obviously was the capstone of, of what you call the highlight of your professional life serving as the US yes. ambassador to Vietnam. Uh, you, you leave that post with a change in administrations. And with the change in administrations, you see some of the things that you accomplished and the administration, the Obama administration accomplished being undone. Uh, yes. Prominent, uh, I think, being uh, the uh, disengagement from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, give me your take on that. How did that make you feel to see that happen just so soon after you served as the U.S. ambassador to Vietnam? Well, that was really tough. Uh, as you mentioned, those, those three days of hosting Obama were probably, the, those were the highlight of 30 years as a diplomat. And then um, uh, a president came into office whose values and methods I didn't necessarily share or uh, think were going to be effective. 
And yeah, and I think day one of his presidency, he pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I had spent two and a half years working on bringing Vietnam into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. In fact, I had, I had uh, really pushed the leadership of Vietnam to take great risks to join that trade agreement. It was hard for them. We, were, we asked things in that agreement uh, of them that were breathtaking. We, in fact, we had, we had achieved, I think, what was the most significant human rights agreement we had ever achieved, achieved with Vietnam when we persuaded the Communist Party to uh, permit freedom of association for workers, a huge advancement in, in workers' rights. And we threw it all away. Uh, so we walked away from that agreement and I thought we hurt America's standing in Asia, certainly in Vietnam. Um, and I thought we just missed an enormous amount of opportunity. And this president who, who uh, projected himself as a great negotiator had just thrown away the biggest leverage we possibly had could have in dealing with China. Uh, so I, I thought it was a, a catastrophe. And um, I, I, I offered my resignation. It wasn't accepted. And I thought, well, you know, I will, as long as I can be useful and keep pushing forward this relationship, I'll do what I can. But if the moment comes where ethically I can't do it, I'll, I'll be out, I'll resign. And so I stayed for 10 months in the new administration. When, and when I was asked about withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, for example, I didn't lie, I didn't pretend that I thought it was a great idea. I just said, I think ultimately um, American interests require us to stay engaged in Asia, so we will find ways. And the Vietnamese were very practical. And instead of that withdrawal becoming a break in the relationship and, and destroying trust and setting us back, they were very practical and they said, well, well, let's figure out other ways to keep the economic relationship moving forward. And so Vietnam's prime minister was the first to call the president elect, the first to meet with him in the Oval Office. And I thought, well, I'm gonna do as much as I can to keep this relationship uh, from going off the rails. And we moved, we kept actually kept moving forward on the security side of the relationship. And I actually, I believe, a lot was accomplished during the, the Trump administration that was positive in US economic relations, uh, US uh, Vietnam relations. Um, so I'm glad I stayed for as long as I did, but the time came when I, I couldn't continue. And after you had left the Foreign Service, after you left your post as ambassador to Vietnam, uh, how did you view, just as an outsider, that US relationship with Vietnam? Was it um, as strong as it was when you were serving as ambassador, uh, you know, leaving aside what happened with uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, were other aspects of the relationship still as strong as they were? They were. Um, uh, my successor, as we always do, you sort of pass the baton. I, I built on what my predecessors had done and my successor, I think, built on what uh, they and I had done. And so, for example, uh, the first visit by a U.S. aircraft carrier to Da Nang since the war uh, occurred in uh, April 2018. And that was something that we had been able to set in motion when I was ambassador, but it went forward. And, and uh, I think President Trump's meeting with the Vietnamese leaders at APEC 2017, the APEC 2017 summit, was probably helpful in that regard. And then, and now actually it's become uh, almost routine. Every two years, an American air aircraft carrier visits Vietnam. But if you think about, that's actually pretty astonishing because the last time an aircraft carrier had gone there before 2018 was during the war. 5,000 soldiers came, sailors came uh, ashore in Da Nang in 2018. That was the largest contingent of uniformed Americans since the war. Um, and it went off without a hitch. And the, the, I think the relationship kept moving forward, that we had a, we'd built up enough trust and enough momentum, and we were still doing things together, that we were able to keep moving forward, even with, with changes in the United States and changes in Vietnam, because um, there were, there were uh, changes at the top in Vietnam that had a real impact on the relationship as well. So how do you see this relationship progressing uh, with the Biden administration? Uh, does President Biden, from your understanding, see the 
importance of this relationship, not only the strategic relationship, but also the importance of the economic uh, relationship that the US has with Vietnam. Uh, will this administration uh, do things differently than the Trump administration? G give me your take as someone who's been so intimately involved in this relationship over the course of your professional life. My take is that the Biden administration sees it as incredibly important. And so even when you know people started to travel again at senior levels, Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense, went to Vietnam. Kamala Harris, vice president, on her second overseas trip, went to Vietnam. They kept moving forward in these critical areas like health collaboration, uh, collaboration on the environment. Uh, the administration has provided support to Vietnam for recovering from COVID vaccines, 6 million vaccines or, or more. Um, I, and then today, uh, the president uh, participated in the US ASEAN summit and emphasized health collaboration and economic collaboration and work together on the environment and the energy transition. So my belief is they're, they're moving forward uh, and they, there's a, a, a deep understanding of the significance of Vietnam within Southeast Asia as an important regional player, important partner uh, for the United States. There is one quibble that I have. Um, I'd love to see more done in the trade area. I, I think we lost something when we, we pulled out of TPP. We can't go right back to TPP now. Why not? Um, I think politi well, I think politically, it would be very difficult to, to join uh, the CPTPP right now. The constituencies uh, aren't yet lined up. It's gotta be accepted by, uh, by the American people. It's gotta be a bipartisan effort. And I don't think the stars are yet aligned, but I think you could take, take some interim steps. I think a digital trade agreement with the nations of Southeast Asia, especially those that are members of the CPTPP uh, would be hugely helpful because if we don't write the rules on the digital economy, someone else will, and we won't like them. And other countries are moving forward with agreements that include uh, uh, rules of the road for the digital economy, RCEP. China is in it, United States is not. Uh, there are bilateral trade agreements between Singapore and various nations that uh, are advancing the, the rules of the road for the digital economy. They're in it, we're not. Vietnam has a, a free trade agreement with the European Union. We're not part of that. So the world isn't sort of sitting around and waiting for America to get its act together on trade. And I think uh, China's uh, application for membership in the CPTPP is a wake up call. Because in Asia, trade is strategy. It, it's not just about planes and ships, it's about economic engagement and trade. So we need to get back into that game. And I would love to see a proactive, positive trade agenda with regard to uh, Vietnam and, and Southeast Asia. And I'd like to see it as soon as possible. We haven't spoken all that much with uh, the limited amount of time that we have left to, to talk about China uh, and the way that China views right now the US relationship with Vietnam. Are, are they comfortable with it? Do they want to somehow drive a wedge in this relationship? Give me your take about how China views this relationship now as well as into the future. No, I don't think they're particularly comfortable with it. I think. The Chinese, the way they talk about, for example, um, what the U.S. has done to try to um, reassert rule of law in the South China Sea, is they say, well, you know, this is a distant power meddling in our region. Well, I'm sorry, but the south, half of the world's seaborne trade passes through the South China Sea. The United States is a maritime power. We have stood for freedom of navigation for 250 years. We're not going to suddenly say, oh, okay, well, um, that's your lake, and we'll stay out of it. And you set all the rules for that major international uh, uh, passageway. Um, we're not going to do that. We we have interests. We have, I think, vital interests in freedom of navigation in that region. And so we are on the side of Vietnam and the Philippines and other nations that are are insisting on rule of law being adhered to in a place like the South China Sea. The Chinese wish we would wouldn't do that. They, they, want it, they want it to be like their Monroe Doctrine where foreign powers stay out and they 
and they write the rules, but uh, that's not going to happen. So they're uneasy. The Chinese are uneasy about that. They're un I think they're uneasy about the security relationship that exists between the United States and Vietnam. Um, they would like Vietnam to be more dependent on them. And Vietnam wants to be independent. Uh, it's, we, our mantra always was, and I think still is, the United States supports a strong, prosperous, independent Vietnam that uh, respects human rights and the rule of law. And that is in our interest. And I would argue that it's also very much in Vietnam's interest. And yeah. independent uh, means no dominant power, no power determining Vietnam's future except Vietnam. That will be Vietnam that will decide what's, what's best for Vietnam. And I, I think we can be uh, a good partner to Vietnam and make sure that uh, there are strategic options, that that nation has uh, strategic options and doesn't have to be ruled by anybody else. This may all be dependent, of course, on the situation as it relates to the COVID pandemic, but how important is it, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for President Biden uh, to travel to Asia uh, over the course of maybe even the next year? Uh, the ASEAN uh, meeting, which is taking place today virtually, is one that uh, a U.S. president typically uh, attends in person. Uh, is this important in terms of sending a certain message to Vietnam and other Asian countries that uh, align with US interests? It is, it's very important. And if you think about it, other US president, presidents, when they've made their first trips to Asia, have almost always gone to our uh, very traditional allies. They've gone to, uh, to Japan, they've gone to Korea on their maiden trip to Asia. Um, some have gone to China very early on in their, their tenures. What if, what if President Biden were to decide to go to Southeast Asia first uh, before going to Northeast Asia? What if he were to meet with, uh, with ASEAN leaders in Jakarta, where the, where the ASEAN headquarters is? That would be historic. It would be very significant. It would make it clear we're back and we're, you know, we're in Asia and we're going to provide leadership in Asia. Um, I think it would be tremendous if, if uh, such a decision uh, were made if there were if if there was a trip to Southeast Asia very very early in President Biden's tenure. Just one final thing as we we wrap up our our discussion, which I've enjoyed so much, uh, and that's just talking about the manner in which you were able to put together this book. It, it's so well documented, and I'm curious as to whether or not you know as over the course of your diplomatic career, over the course of your time as the U.S. ambassador to Vietnam, you're taking copious notes uh, <laughs> so that you deliver such a, a great book uh, like the one that you've delivered uh, in, 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 the, in what we're discussing today. Well, thank you so much. If, if people are looking for a really heavy policy book with lots of data and specific recommendation, policy recommendations, this is not that book. Because that's just not how my mind works. The, the, I think reconciliation is about people. So what this is, is a book of stories about people, about the people who took risks in order to make two former enemies become friends. And you know that's why I started with John McCain, because I think that his story is so important. And John, Mc, John Kerry's story and Pete Peterson's story and the stories of their counterparts in Vietnam who took huge risks for this relationship. I remember stories. I think like a lot of human beings, you know, I'm sort of wired to remember stories. I don't remember numbers very well, but I remember stories. And when I was first in Vietnam in 1996 to 98, I did take a lot of notes because I thought, God, I'm really, I'm here, the president of the creation. I got to remember this. And so, and I kept those notes and then I never, they never made it into a book. Um, so then when I went back as ambassador, actually, I still had those notes. And I, I didn't take a, uh, keep a journal. I wasn't disciplined enough. But I took a lot of photos. And I would write down stories when I thought there was a really interesting story, something that happened that moved me, or that was powerful in one way, or that symbolized reconciliation. That I would write down. And so when you leave the State Department, they take away your email. Um, and I had no access to you know, my calendar or dates or, or my, you know, my former email exchanges with people and none of that. So I kind of had to piece it together. But I had a lot of willing friends, a lot of friends who cared about this story 
the story of reconciliation being told accurately. And I kept writing to friends, and do you remember when such and such a thing happened? And do you remember the people we met on this day and what they were like? And, and I just kept writing to people and talking to people and gathering, the, filling in the gaps. Because I had a, uh, I had kind of the story, the big story in my head, but there were some gaps and my friends helped me, both Vietnamese and Americans helped me fill in those gaps. And I think they helped me make the stories not only more accurate, but better, uh, richer. And, you know, there's, there's more than just my perspective in this book. Well, you can tell, uh, certainly I can, all the hard work that went into this uh, book. And you talk about the pictures, and there are pictures in this book, but I find that pictures often jog your memory as well. Mm -hmm. And that's clearly what happened when, when you were uh, recounting uh, all the years that you had some involvement with Vietnam from your, your time as a, a junior foreign service officer to your time as the U.S. ambassador to Vietnam. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sending me a copy to read before our, our conversation. And I'm sure that uh, the audience that is uh, watching this webinar will enjoy it as well. Ambassador Ted Osius, thanks again. Really enjoyed this. And to the McCain Institute, thank you for uh, allowing us to discuss such an important book, an important book, as you mentioned, Ambassador, uh, that has uh, a, a importance on this anniversary uh, for Senator John McCain, the 54th uh, anniversary of the shooting down of his plane over Hanoi. So again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I really enjoyed uh, reading, uh, reading your book. Thank you, John. I, I enjoyed this conversation and I'm deeply grateful to the McCain Institute and to the man after whom it is named. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll talk soon and uh, have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I really enjoyed it. Really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank, I did too. I get a little emotional every once in a while, but I think, you know, that's just the way it is. <laughs> uh, I, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, and I love doing it with the McCain Institute because, yeah. uh, you know, he's a hero. Yeah, he is. Absolutely. He is definitely Thanks a hero. Hope, I hope to see you in person soon. Me too. Thanks very much. All right. Bye now. All right.